thanks to Kyle and uh, thanks to SpacePoint. I'm really excited to be the inaugural speaker uh, for this new organization up here to try to uh, bring people into space. Uh, obviously, I'm into space, that's why I'm here. Uh, that's why I've been doing what I've been doing my whole career. So I'm excited to be able to hopefully share some of that uh, with you today. So today's program is a science program and then a, a science fictional program. And you may be surprised to hear that I'll be talking about a nuclear-powered interplanetary quadcopter, and that's not the fiction part, okay? That's the real part. Um, I, as uh, Kyle mentioned, I'm the deputy principal investigator, so sort of like the vice president of this space mission that we proposed to NASA back in 2016, and that we're selected for flight uh, in 2019, um, and this is my little dragonfly model. Um, the real thing is much bigger than this, though. Um, but this is this is this is what we're going to just get started with. So I hope to convey to you today um, where I were going to Saturn's moon Titan, um, why that's awesome, the cool things we're going to be able to do there, and then we'll uh, answer some of your questions later. So uh, there are maybe seven big moons in the solar system. Okay, our moon's one of them. So like, yeah, we're in the big we're, we're in the big leagues. Um, the others are the four big moons around Jupiter, the Galilean moons, and then one big moon around Neptune called Triton. But Saturn's big moon Titan here um, stands out among all of these. So it orbits around the gas giant planet Saturn. It's about eight times the radius of the Earth, so it's, Saturn's pretty fat. Uh, but Titan itself is actually quite large um, for uh, a moon, in fact, is larger than the planet Mercury in terms of its radius. So it's like, it's big. Um, it's really uh, big and rather important. In fact, I think Titan is one of these four like most important places in the solar system. And the reason these are the most important places is that these are the four places that both have a solid surface, but also a thick atmosphere, okay? There's plenty of places out there in the solar system that have a solid surface, but don't have any air. So, like our moon, for instance. You guys heard the joke about the restaurant on the moon? Great food, no atmosphere. <laughs> so, there are places like that, like Mercury, asteroids, all these other moons that don't have any air. And then there's planets like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, where it's air all the way down, okay? There never is a solid surface, because those planets are so large, uh, they don't actually have a solid surface at all. But the only places that have a solid surface and a thick atmosphere are the planet Venus, the planet Earth, Mars, and then this moon in the outer solar system called Titan. So these are all to scale, okay? So Venus and the Earth are big, Mars is big. Titan's not quite as big as Mars, but it's, it's pretty big. Um, but what's interesting about these places is of these four places, really, Titan is the most similar to Earth in many ways. Not every way, but many ways. Um, so one of those ways is in the composition of its atmosphere. So what, anyone know, what, what are you mostly breathing right now? Nitrogen. nitrogen, that's right, N2 nitrogen. The atmosphere on Titan is also mostly nitrogen. It's the same stuff. Whereas the atmosphere on Venus and Mars is mostly carbon dioxide. There's a little carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere, but not very much. But that's what makes up all the atmosphere on Venus and Mars. Furthermore, if you look at how thick the atmosphere is on Titan, it is about 50% higher pressure. So a little half, half again as dense or um, as high pressure as the, the pressure is here on Earth. So it's a little more, but it's not too different. Contrast that with like Venus, okay? At the surface of Venus, the atmosphere is 100 times thicker than it is on Earth, okay? The pressure of the air at the surface of Venus is the same as the pressure at the bottom of the ocean on Earth. It is super high pressure down there. Similarly, Mars has a pressure that's 200 times thinner than Earth. So there's some air on Mars, but like, you know, like, not a lot. In contrast, Earth, uh, and, and uh, in compared uh, to Earth, Titan is sort of in the Goldilocks zone. It's just right. 1.5 bars pressure, a little more than Earth, but not that much. In fact, 
if for some reason you needed to live in a 1.5 bar atmosphere chamber or something, you could totally live at 1.5 bars. It's not too bad. If you try to live at the 0 0.006 bars uh, on the surface of Mars, your blood would boil and freeze at the same time. So that, that'd be bad. Let's, let's not do that. But Titan's not too different. The place that Titan is very different, however, though, is in its temperature, okay? Titan is around Saturn, which is 10 times further from the sun than the Earth. So it's like way out there. The sunlight there is only 1% as strong as it is here, and so the temperature on Titan is really low. So I'm giving the temperatures here in the scientific um, version of, of temperature, which is in Kelvin. So the temperature on Earth is about 300 Kelvin. And the temperature at Mars is quite a bit lower than that, 210 Kelvin. The temperature on Titan is 90 Kelvin. So this is negative 300 Fahrenheit. Yeah, it's cold. It's so cold that although Titan is made up a lot of water, so the, lot, the surface of Titan is water, but at 90 Kelvin, that water is totally solid ice, okay? So like, the water on Titan is like the rock on Earth. It is totally hard. It doesn't flow like glaciers or anything. But there is water at the surface of Titan. Um, contrast this with, uh, say, the planet Venus, where the temperature is 700 Kelvin and will melt lead. So Venus, although it's on this chart, Venus is really kind of hard to explore, OK? We sent landers down to the surface of Venus, but they melt after an hour and a half. So. Um, it's kind of a hard place to get to and a hard place to explore, whereas we've sent rovers to Titan, or to Mars, and now we want to explore Titan maybe some, sort of similarly to the way that we've used those rovers to explore Mars. The other reason that Titan is so amazing is that it is part of a new class of planet that we've kind of just recognized in the last 20 years called an ocean world. So when the Voyagers first flew by the moons of Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune in the outer solar system. It took pictures of them as it went by, and they're like, yep. And they're like kind of, uh, you know, ice cubes with craters on them. Uh, they look like frozen ice moons. So we're like, okay, those are frozen ice moons. But when we went back to Jupiter's moon Europa with the Galileo mission in the 1990s, um, we recognized that it's not frozen solid. If you, in fact, dig down underneath the surface of Europa, you get to a liquid water layer beneath the ice on the outside. So just like if you drill down deep into the earth, you get to liquid iron near the core. If you drill down into uh, Europa around Jupiter, you get to liquid water. And Titan is the same way. If you drill down far enough, we think about 100 kilometers, so it's pretty deep ice, but there's a liquid water ocean beneath that ice. and that ocean, in fact, has more than 10 times more water than we have here on the Earth. So this has been a huge advance for, our, for my field, okay, for understanding where we are in the universe. We thought that Titan, or that Earth is this unusual place because of all the water. Um, I know I watched this uh, science fiction movie the other day called Oblivion with Tom Cruise in it. Who's seen that? Yeah, yeah okay. It turns out the aliens are here to like suck the ocean away and steal all our water. Okay, they should have just gone to Europa. Okay, they can have Europa. I mean, you don't have to steal our water. Uh, the other sad thing about Oblivion is that they were trying. You know, everyone was escaping to Titan, and it turned out it was all a lie. Oh, sorry. It. Anyway, so I thought they were getting to Titan. I thought we kept, kept kept waiting for that part. It was going to be great. So what's really awesome about Saturn's moon Titan is that it has this air, but it also has a bunch of liquid water. So what do we think you need? in order to form life in the universe. Well, I'm not a biologist, okay? I'm an astronomer, so to me, I kind of take a step back, and I think really big picture. I mean, what are the things you really need? Well, we think you need a liquid for the chemistry to occur within, so like a solvent for that to happen. Water, obviously, is what we use here on Earth, so we think you need water. We think you need energy to power reactions. Um, and so that, but that energy can come from a lot of different places. It can come from chemicals, it can come from sunlight, uh, it can come from heat, like um, comes up from the bottom of the ocean on Earth in some places. Um, and we think that the energy is probably present, plenty of energy in all of these places for life. But 
What's unusual uh, about Titan in particular is that Titan, in addition to have, having water and energy, has a bunch of carbon in the atmosphere. So I said its atmosphere was mostly nitrogen, and that's true. But a small constituent, maybe 5% of Titan's atmosphere, is made of methane. So it's CH4. This is the, if you have a gas stove, you're burning with methane, all right? But on Titan, that methane's very cold, and so that methane is in fact near its triple point, meaning that it can be either a solid, a liquid, or a gas. So interestingly, within Titan's atmosphere there, that methane can form clouds, it can form rain, and it can run off on the surface in rivers, and it can run down to uh, lakes and seas of liquid methane at the poles, which I'll show you in a minute. But up in the atmosphere, that methane, CH4, gets hit by solar ultraviolet, it busts the methane apart, and the methane will recombine into larger and larger molecules that can be very interesting from an organic chemistry point of view, but also uh, build themselves up into solid particles, such that if you try to look at Titan, it looks like this picture on the left. It doesn't look that much, okay? It looks like an orange billiard ball. <laughs> What's happening there is, all these particles in the atmosphere are preventing you from seeing through it. So this is actually quite like, um, we have a, some terrestrial analogs for what this atmosphere full of particles is like. It's like Sandpoint in September, <laughs> when it's smoky, okay? We're basically looking through all this smoky particles, trying to see down to the surface of Titan, and you really can't see it in visible light. If, however, you switch to using a different wavelength of light, a different color of light, to infrared light, then you can see through the haze particles in the atmosphere, and you can see down to the surface. So this is a movie I made of infrared images of Titan from the Cassini spacecraft, which was orbiting Saturn and took pictures of Titan from 2004 through 2017. Um, and you can see that when you look through this haze down to the surface, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of things happening on the surface. We now know that these brown areas near Titan's equator are giant sand dunes. The green stuff is water ice that's covered in oak, covered in this, this haze that's falling out of the atmosphere. Some places you see impact craters. Here's an impact crater where an asteroid is slammed into Titan and blasted its surface apart. Here, these orange areas are former methane seas that have dried up. So this is like salt flats on Earth, although on Titan, the, the material left over isn't salt. We think it's probably some sort of organic material. Um, some places, like over here, you can see it looks a little bit blue. Might be hard to see that. But these areas that are blue are areas of enhanced water ice, so places, places where they've either been washed clean or there's more water at the surface. So we now, as a result of the Cassini mission, know a lot more about what's happening at the surface of Titan, uh, and we're able to um, take a look at some of these in detail, and that sort of led us to be able to design what the next mission to Titan should be. Um, so I've been, uh, as I mentioned, I've been working on that for, uh, gosh, I said 2016, but it's probably, it's almost, it's almost been 10 years now. And so what we want to do is we want to figure out on Titan where and how and what might happen when this liquid water gets in contact with all these complex and interesting organic molecules at the surface. And the reason we think that's interesting is that when you take water and you mix organics into it, we think this is analogous to what might have occurred on the early Earth four billion years ago, before there was life. Somehow there, on Earth, there was a time before there was life on Earth, and life formed and we've lost the ability to see how that happened because it happened four billion years ago, okay? All those changes have been buried and eroded away and it's really hard to figure out what that process may have looked like. But out at Titan, you, you were taking those organic materials, we're mixing them with water, and we wanna know what pathways that organic chemistry might take, how might it progress and how far might it progress toward from the formation of life, and we also want to ask, has the process on Titan gotten to the point where it's able to make very simple self-replicating molecules or very small um, cells that would uh, uh, constitute life itself? 
So that's why we want to go to an impact crater. Okay, it's not immediately obvious why you want to go to a crater, but the reason we want to go to a crater is that we want to go to a place where we know there has been liquid water and it's been in contact with this organic material. This impact crater is called SELK, S-E-L-K crater, and it's about 80 kilometers across, okay? So it's like 50 miles, like the distance between here and Coeur d'Alene. So um, this was made by an asteroid or a comet that was about eight or 10 kilometers across, so about five miles across, that slammed into Titan at about 20 kilometers per second is how fast it was going. So, I don't want to get technical on you, but that's in the business what we call hella fast, okay? <laughs> so when you slam into a, uh, something that's, you know, the size of a city, and it's going 20 kilometers per second, it releases a tremendous amount of energy, kinetic energy. And it turns out, in our simulations, in our comparison to impact craters both on the Earth and on other planets, we know that the majority, more than 50% of that energy goes toward melting target rock. And on Titan, the target rock is water ice. So we think that this impactor should have made what we call an impact melt pool that was 100 meters deep, so 300 feet deep. How, how deep is Lake Pandora? Is it? 1,000 feet, okay, so it's not quite that, uh, you know, not quite that deep, but uh, getting close, a third of that deep, um, and even though it's very cold in the atmosphere on Titan, once this starts to freeze over, we think that parts of it would have remained liquid for tens of thousands of years. So we want to go and land and get to this crater to be able to sample this previously liquid water. Okay, it's frozen today, but it was liquid then. It was interacting with those organics. We want to explore this uh, process of chemistry and how far it made it progress toward life. So let me tell you a little bit more about the environment that we'll be going in when we get to Titan. Uh, these are other near-infrared pictures of Titan uh, that use different colors of light. So your eye sees light that's about half a micron in wavelength, or um, half of a millionth of a meter. Uh, these light um, that we're going to make these pictures is about five to ten times longer in wavelength, so it's able to see through that haze. But with this color scheme, I, uh, I'm using the pink is the, that those haze, the smoke particles that are in the atmosphere. Green, you can see, is the surface, but uh, I've chosen this color scheme to highlight these clouds on Titan that are in blue and white here. So these clouds are made not of water, because water's all frozen there, but they're made of methane, so natural gas. When you get it cold enough, like when you get water cold enough, it starts to condense out as clouds, and these are clouds um, within, of methane within Titan's atmosphere. In fact, using the Cassini spacecraft, we have seen these clouds sort of start low and billow up in the atmosphere and peak out uh, at an anvil cloud like a thunderstorm cloud on Earth. So these are active rainstorms that we're seeing on another planet. And this is the only other place that we know of in the universe where that liquid gets all the way to the ground and can then flow along the ground once it hits the ground. So I call it thunderstorms in quotes though, because like, I mean, they look like our thunderstorms, but we've listened for thunder in the, you know, with our radio telescope. And we looked for flashes and we haven't seen, we haven't seen any lightning. So they're thunderstorms without the, you know, the thunder part. So they're, they're big convective storms uh, that are occurring uh, on, on Titan. Uh, the, Cassini spacecraft, when it arrived at Titan um, in, or in the Saturn system in 20, 2004, released a small little subspacecraft called Huygens, named after the guy who discovered uh, Titan back 400 years ago. And that small spacecraft here uh, entered the atmosphere and fell down toward the surface. As it was doing so, it was able to use another method to see through the haze, which is to just go below it, okay, so it cheated. It went under the haze and was able to take pictures of the surface. Um, and it took these views. This is a, a simulated view based on the observations it took of one of the areas uh, near where it landed. And what you can see here are little river network structures that are really unusual. In fact, Earth 
and Titan are the only places you see these sort of dendritic, what we call them, river networks um, that result from what happens when you get rainfall on a surface and that rainfall drives erosion. So there's no rain on Mars, there's no rain on Venus, there's no rain anywhere else in the solar system that hits the ground, but Earth and Titan are the two places where it's this geological process of the rain eroding the ground that really dominates what we see um, in terms of what the surface looks like. So this probe was battery powered, so it only lasted for two hours. And it didn't have a landing system. It was only designed to come through the atmosphere, okay? But Titan, with its very thick atmosphere, its density is one and a half times Earth's atmospheric density, but it's really cold, so there's actually, the uh, atmospheric density is, is much higher than the pressure. Sorry, the pressure is one and a half times. The density is more like five times. And because it's small, like our moon, the gravity on Titan is about the same as that on our moon, about seven times less than the gravity on Earth. So when the Huygens probe hit the ground, it was fine. It survived, even though it doesn't have any retro rockets or airbags or a landing system. Just with a parachute, it was going slow enough that it was able to land on the surface, and we think this is what it may have looked like. But this over here, this orange picture, you guys don't appreciate how awesome this picture is, okay? This is a picture from the surface of Titan taken by that Huygens probe, okay? And so this probe is about this big across. So it's not very big, and this camera wasn't designed to really take pictures of the surface, so that camera is really low. So imagine, not that you're looking at it, but you're looking at that, you're looking at it from about here, okay? So these are not, these objects here that you're seeing are not giant boulders out on the surface of Titan. Those are ice rocks about the size of my fist here, about 10 centimeters across. Um, and you can see here, there's some granular material. These are sort of like very small, um, maybe sand, maybe slightly larger particles that are nearer to the surface here. This, uh, the Huygens probe had a lamp on it, so the, this is where the lamp is illuminating the surface. Unfortunately, because it wasn't designed to take, to land on the surface, to get all the way down and to take pictures, Huygens, for the last half hour before its battery ran out, kept taking pictures of the same thing over and over again. So this is all we have, okay? Um, but because we have this picture, I, when you show this picture to the NASA engineers that design landers, and they get calm, okay? There's no jagged boulders, there's no ice crevasses that your lander has to, has to avoid or anything. This is a very safe looking environment in which to land. So what we want to do is we want to be able to go back, we want to be able to like drill into these solid ice particles and figure out the chemistry of that water and what that water is like and what the organics what the carbon molecules within that water might be like and what they may have done. And this is an equivalent image that you might take from our moon, just showing you that perspective that, yeah, these are, these are, are not giant uh, objects, they're actually relatively small. But this is pretty amazing. I mean, like, what places in our solar system do we have pictures from the surface of other than the Earth? There's a couple pictures from the Soviet Venus landers before they melted. There's pictures from the moon, like this one. There's pictures of Mars. And there's pictures of Titan. There are not many places we have landed and taken pictures from the surface successfully in the solar system. So the fact that we have this picture actually is both scientifically valuable, I think really interesting inherently, but it also has been enabling for us to be able to design a future mission because we know there are nice, flat, safe places to land on Titan, um, which we don't know, say, about Jupiter's moon Europa, which makes it much harder to design a mission to go there. So when um, Cassini arrived at Titan in 2004, it was during Titan's southern summer. Because Titan is around Saturn, Saturn takes 28 years to go around the sun. So a full year on Titan is 28 Earth's years. And so a single season is seven Earth years. It feels even longer than spring in the Northwest, okay? So we arrived in southern summer, so we weren't able to see the very North Pole until we'd been there for five or six years when we were able to take pictures and when we finally got to the North Pole, North Pole of Titan is like right, right here, okay? So these dark areas, which we did not see when we first got there, it turns out these dark areas are giant seas and lakes of liquid methane just sitting out there on the surface. So this is the only place 
in the universe that we know of, where there's like basically lakes, like, like Pandaray here, that are just sitting out on the surface for you to, to take pictures of and for you to study. So um, this, uh, there are three big seas. This one's called Punga Mare. This is like Gia Mare. And this big one over here is called Kraken Mare. Um, mare means sea in Latin. And so the IAU makes us use Latin in those mistakes. Uh, but these little lakes out here are you know, much smaller, um, much more uh, human-sized lakes than you can imagine. This lake right here um, is about a couple hundred kilometers across. And it's called Jingpo Lacus after the um, uh, Chinese word for mirror lake, because we saw a, um, a reflection off of this lake. But I'm partial to this one because I, I named this lake. So I, I proposed this lake name um, to the International Astronomical Union. And I and my students have named many of these lakes um, that are up near Titan's North Pole. So um, it's kind of exciting that we here in Idaho are like the ones that are naming these lakes. So every once in a while I sneak in a local name, you know. Um, uh, they want them to be very international, but we try to, we try to do what we can. Um, I mentioned that near Titan's equator, those dark uh, brown bands are sand dunes. And so this is a close-up view of the sand dunes from a different Cassini instrument called the radar instrument. So Cassini's radar sort of fires radio waves down and sees through the atmosphere by using radar instead of looking at um, uh, in the near infrared. But when it looks through Titan's atmosphere, it sees these long, dark lines uh, in the surface, and these uh, are giant sand dunes. Um, these pixels are about a, a half a kilometer across each, okay? So this is a big view. And these sand dunes we see on Titan are about 100 meters high. They go for hundreds of kilometers down in the down, uh, uh, downstream direction. They are about three or four kilometers between, maybe two miles between each dune. And what's, I think, the most amazing thing about these dunes, maybe not the most, one of the most amazing things, is that they are the same size and scale as the most common types of dunes that we see on Earth, which are called longitudinal dunes. Um, unfortunately, there are none in the Western Hemisphere, but the dunes in the Sahara Desert, the Arabian Desert, the Gobi Desert, the deserts in Australia are all longitudinal type, type dunes. And uh, are the ones in the country of Namibia, the Namib Desert in Southwest Africa. So I was fortunate enough to be able to visit these. This is a picture I took from the top of a sand dune. And climbing up 100 meters or 300 feet of elevation gain doesn't sound like that much, but recall as you climb up a sand dune, right, every, every step you go up, you fall back two thirds. Okay, this is really hard to climb this thing. <laughs> it takes about an hour. Um, but here we are looking down the crest of one of these dunes, and it goes on for tens of kilometers down in this direction. There's another neighboring dune next to it on either side. And in between there, there's an area where there's no sand called an interdune. Now, I'm trained as an astronomer and a physicist, so I, this surprised me. But it turns out this is normal on Earth, that you, when you form these type of longitudinal sand dunes, you build up these giant 100 meter high mountains of sand. And then there's an area next to it where there's no sand at all. And then there's another mountain of sand next to that, and there's no sand. So what's amazing about sand dunes is they organize themselves into these structures without, where you get sand in one place and then no sand in between. On Earth, the sand is made of silicon dioxide, mostly SiO2, so it's made of rock. On Titan, the sands are not made of rock, though. The sand on Titan is made of organic particles, ultimately derived from this atmospheric haze process. So it's kind of hard to think of like what's going on. So we sort of use this as an, an, as an analogy. Imagine like 100 meter high mountains of coffee grounds going for hundreds of kilometers downwind, right? This is a really crazy place. So what I want to do, we're going to land. We want to go ultimately get to this impact crater with Dragonfly. But uh, has anyone ever visited Meteor Crater in Arizona? Raise your hand. Okay, a couple people. You, took, you look at a picture of Meteor Crater in Arizona, it makes the engineers very nervous. Okay, there's all these cliffs and rocks and all over the place and like, can't, it's not, okay. So we are instead of landing in that crater initially, we are going to initially land in the sand dunes next to the crater because these are nice, fluffy, easy places to land, okay? 
these interdunes we think should be pretty flat and free of rocks. Uh, the sand dunes themselves should have nice areas that are of low slope and don't have any rocks on them. And by landing here, we should be able to, we hope, measure the composition of these organic sand dunes and learn more about this interesting carbon chemistry. And at the same time, just be able to hop over a couple hundred meters and be able to land in the interdune and drill into these ice rocks and measure the composition of those ice rocks. So this is the kind of environment that we are going to initially land in. Um, and so we, try, we kind of want to visit, um, and I want to bring the engineers out because they keep talking about what it's going to be like. And I keep telling them, but just being out in these sand dunes is really amazing. Um, and it really gives you a perspective on what we think we're going to be encountering when we, get, uh, when we eventually get to Titan. So this is what that might look like. This is the vehicle that we've invented called Dragonfly. It is a dual quadcopter or an octocopter. We've got eight different rotors, each on four different, there's four different stalks, and each stalk has two rotors on it, one on the top and one on the bottom and they're contra-rotating. So the, 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 the propeller on top goes the opposite way than the propeller on the bottom. And we do that so that the vehicle has zero net angular momentum. It makes it easier to, to, to maneuver it around, to have contra-rotating propellers in each place. And those propellers provide for us the mobility to be able to move our science experiments around in the same way that we've done with rovers on Mars. Um, I mean, I thought of trying to put down a rover on Titan. Why wouldn't that work? Well, has anyone tried to drive through sand in a, in, a, in a 4x4? Okay, you can do it, mostly, but if you get loose sand, you can get stuck very easily. And in fact, the Mars rovers have gotten stuck in sand dunes on Mars, and they mostly try to drive around them now. So on Titan, the best way to get around is actually not with wheels. It's by turning yourself into a giant quadcopter instead. With that atmosphere that's five times thicker than Earth, and the gravity that's seven times lower than Earth is actually 42 times easier to fly on Titan than it is on Earth. You take the same vehicle, basically, you put it on Titan, you need 40 time, 42 times less power, fewer watts, to be able to fly than you would to fly that same vehicle on the Earth. This is the best place in the solar system to fly, and this is that which would make this, makes this such an effective way to get around on this amazing outer solar system moon. So I have uh, my little model here in front. Um, I tried to get a 3D printed version and they quoted me three or $4,000. So my students got this for 99 bucks at pinatas.com. So um, <laughs> this is not the actual size of the vehicle though. This is a very small scale version. The actual vehicle is huge. So usually you think of a little quadcopter, you think of that thing you bought on Amazon that flies around the living room. Our uh, quadcopter instead is uh, mass is about a ton, less than a little less than a metric ton, and has uh, is about four and a half meters long. It is huge. It's so big, um, uh, and the reason it's that big, or the reason it can't be bigger, actually, is that we're limited by the size of the nose cone of the rocket we have to launch in. Okay. Yeah, we want to fly on Titan, but first we kind of have to fly through Earth's atmosphere and then through space to be able to get there. So that's what limits our size. Uh, we have four different scientific instruments on board. Uh, we have eight, a set of eight different cameras that are looking out. So we're going to have four different cameras looking sort of forward, actually one looking left, right, and center, and then another high-res camera looking forward. We have two cameras looking down the sides, and we call these our workspace cameras. Those take pictures looking down at the skids because we have, a, we have this instrument over here, which is a drill. So we want to be able to drill into the surface, turn that, those ice rocks into little particulates that we can um, sample, and we want to be able to take pictures of that process as it happens. And then we have two extremely high resolution cameras that are zoomed in super far on the exact drill site itself. We want to be able to basically see the individual sand grains and measure how big they are. So we'll be taking pictures of the individual sand grains right at the drill site with those very high resolution cameras. Um, we're also going to be measuring the atmospheric conditions like the wind speed, the wind direction. Uh, this instrument also has a seismometer on board that will be built by the Japanese Space Agency that we actually lower down to measure Titan quakes. Are there Titan quakes? 
No one's ever put a seismometer on one of these ocean worlds before, so we don't know. We're going to be the first measurement of how seismically active, how geologically active these kind of worlds are. So we're going to, that's um, located right here. See this thing? That's located on a winch. So if we get it, we can wear it down to the surface. And then before we take off, we, we raise it back up again. Um, we then have what's called a gamma ray neutron spectrometer that um, is a device that pumps neutrons into the surface. When that happens, they knock electrons out of atoms that produce gamma rays, very high energy light particles that are characteristic energy that allows us to measure the composition of elements in the surface. Like, is there a lot of sodium? Is there oxygen? This will allow us to measure that. And then our Cadillac instrument, our most important instrument is the mass spectrometer that is going to not measure the elemental composition, but rather measure the molecular composition. So like how big the molecules are and what mo molecules those are in the surface. So this isn't, unfortunately, it's not like in Star Trek where they whip out a tricorder and they say, oh, look, Jim, this is made of all this stuff, okay? Actually figuring out the composition, the, the chemical composition of materials in space is quite hard. And so this is how we're gonna do it. We run it through this mass spectrometer, which tells us how big the molecules are from which we can infer what their composition must be. Um, how do we get those samples? The mass spectrometer is up here in the front part, the top front part of the, uh, of the lander, uh, the part we call the attic. And how do we, so how do we get the sample up there from the surface of Titan? Well, on Mars, they've done sampling with uh, a little scoop. They kind of scoop into the surface and they tested this out on Earth. It worked pretty well. On Mars, they scooped out the surface and they went to dump it into their sample container and like, they went to dump it and it was like, it was stuck up there because the gravity's three times lower on Mars and turns out the soil's super sticky on Mars and they didn't know that, okay? So we have uh, a mechanism to sample the surface of Titan that is the same way that you sample the surface of your living room with a vacuum cleaner. So we have a vacuum that sucks up the sand and the material from Titan and feeds it into the mass spectrometer up here. Titan's the only other place this works than Earth, guys. Okay, like, you try that on Mars, there's not enough air to suck anything up. You try it on Venus, and the air out there, remember, is hot enough to melt lead, so it's like turning your turning a, a flamethrower in on, your, on the interior of your spacecraft. You don't want to do it there either. So this is a really cool way to be able to sample the surface and get that surface dirt material up into this mass spectrometer to measure its composition. Sorry. So how big is this vehicle really? This is our mock-up called the Iron Bird with a sample, uh, an early version of the drill, some of the blowers. These are the blowers that are running uh, the, the vacuum cleaner. And these are the lines that suck the material into this attic where we, do the, we measure the composition. This is how big it is. This is my former student, Shannon McKenzie, um, who is now the deputy project scientist for the mission. She graduated here from the University of Idaho, and she took a job there at the Applied Physics Laboratory in Maryland that's building this vehicle. And she's now uh, really gone to do really great things. She's the deputy project scientist. She knows everything that's going on. Uh, and she's really become really important uh, in the mission. And despite her being so important, I'm using her here as a scale bar. Uh, to show how big this thing actually is. This doesn't even include our power source on the back. So this thing is so huge, you could lay down in there and go to Titan if you wanted. I mean, I don't recommend it because we don't have any snacks on board, but you could, it's so big you could fit in it. This thing is a really, truly large vehicle. And so when you think quadcopter, don't think something like this. Think, you know, it's more like the size of a small car um, that's gonna be flying out there. Uh, as a matter of local interest, um, this vehicle is being built by the Applied Physics Laboratory there in Maryland, but there are all co contractors all over the, the country that will be building different parts of it. Uh, Lockheed Martin is building our spacecraft part that will bring us out there. The uh, entry, descent, and landing system that will protect us from entry of Titan is being built by uh, NASA Langley and NASA uh, Ames in California. Uh, the mass spectrometer instrument is being built at NASA Goddard. Um, but the power source, which is called a, uh, we think of it as a nuclear battery, or it's called a multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator, is built in Idaho. This is built in, uh, at the Idaho National Lab uh, down near Idaho Falls. 
And this is the same kind of power source that powers the two big rovers on Mars right now, Curiosity and Perseverance. And it's the same power source that powered the Pluto probe and the Cassini mission and the Voyager mission. So the Voyager missions were launched when I was born, like in 1977, and they're still going. We're still hearing for them way out in the outer solar system. So if you need power out where there's very little sunlight, we use these nuclear batteries. And these are built here in Idaho. So this is our ultimate power source. So that's the part on the back here is this nuclear battery um, that's providing both our, our electrical power, but as waste heat, we use the waste heat from that RGG to keep our Orlando warm so we don't freeze. This, I said I'm the deputy principal investigator or the vice president of the mission. The president of the mission, the principal investigator, is my colleague Zibby Turtle. Um, and I'm once again using here as a scale bar here for the size of our propellers. These propellers that we use are um, pretty big. They are about the same size as a Cessna propeller, and we've got eight of them. Um, why don't we have them even bigger? Well, once again, we can't fit any bigger rotors inside the nose cone of a rocket. We'd, we'd be too big, okay? So that's our ultimate limiter on how big of rotors we can make. More, bigger rotors are more efficient, but we just can't fit them in there. So we have eight rotors uh, that are huge like this. They're really quite big, um, much bigger than the ones on my even scale model here. And so those are what's providing the lift and allowing us to fly through Titan's atmosphere. Well, no matter how big our rotors are, they're not gonna help us fly through space, right? Because there ain't any air in space. So, uh, in order to get out to space, we're going to launch on our rocket. Our launch period, when the planets are all aligned so that we can get out to Saturn, begins in June of 2027. Um, so we'll launch then, we fly out uh, to the middle of the asteroid belt where we do a rocket burn that will bring us back to get a, to Earth again. So we'll launch from Earth, we fly out, we just got after, um, here we go, after uh, you know three years, we're just back at Earth again. But when we're back at Earth, we get what's called a gravity assist, where Earth's gravity slingshots us out so we can use a smaller rocket um, and be able to get out to Saturn with, a, with the vehicle we have. Uh, and we'll take a total of six and a half years to get to Saturn, and we will arrive by 2034. Uh, the exact arrival date uh, will depend on the details of the rocket and the trajectory, but it'll take six and a half years to get out there. It's a long time. Okay, I'm so jealous of those Mars scientists. They launch, six months later, boom, they're at Mars, okay? When you're going to the outer solar system, you gotta really plan ahead. Uh, and you gotta think ahead, and you gotta make sure that you have you know, people that are gonna be, uh, young people that are gonna be able to do this science by the time we get there, because um, the whole thing, the whole process takes a very long time. Okay, what might it look like when we get there? Um, I don't know if you can click on this movie up there, because I don't actually, I hadn't thought this part ahead. Can I move, play this movie? No, no, maybe not. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Well, you guys, I think, saw this movie at the beginning, because uh, there was a version of it uh, that played uh, before we started. Let me get back there. Yeah, I don't think I can play this. So... All right, so uh, when we get to Titan, we're gonna slam into the atmosphere at seven kilometers per second, which is pretty fast. On the other hand, it's slower than vehicles even arrive at Earth from Earth orbit, so it's not that bad. Uh, the entry, uh, we have a heat shield at the front of our, of our um, capsule, so this thing is all encapsulated within the uh, aero shell here to, prevent it, to protect us from the heating on entry, uh, and then uh, after we hit the atmosphere, we're going to use that atmosphere to slow us down. We'll put out a parachute to slow our descent a bit through the transonic regime until we're going subsonic. Uh, then we pump out an even bigger parachute to slow us down. We then dump our heat shield uh, and we actually let go of the parachute before we get to the ground. So at about a couple thousand feet elevation, we let go and undergo what we call the transition to powered flight, which is where we drop off and start falling and turn our rotors on and start flying away from the back shell. Now, I showed you that picture of Titan from the radar instrument with the half kilometer pixels, okay? So we don't know where the rocks are to avoid on Titan, but we can fly for like half an hour before we run out of battery power. So our plan once we arrive is to fly along 
across the sand dunes looking for a place that's safe to land, okay? So what do we need that's safe? We need to have a place that has slopes less than 10 degrees, so pretty flat, and we need to be far, as far as possible from a rock that should be big enough to be a problem for us. So we actually don't want one of our skids to land on a rock and cause us to tip over. This is something the Apollo landers had to worry about too. They wanted to make sure that they landed on a relatively flat area, free from rocks. So how do we find that? Well, we can just fly and look for one. So we just fly across. We have an onboard LIDAR that takes 3D pictures of the surface. It can identify rocks that we'll avoid, and it can identify the safe slopes. So we kind of fly down, we look for safe spots, and once we see one, we come back around, and we come down, and we land on that exact spot that we previously identified. And then we start, uh, we uh, upload our antenna. Our antenna's on the back here. It's a flat phased array antenna that allows us to point at Earth, and we'll start uplinking our pictures and data. Um, so this is all gonna happen in uh, 2034. Uh, I don't want you, uh, who, who all seen um, like the movies of the Mars lander coming down, this last Perseverance, okay. A couple of people, good, okay. <sighs> Within three days of the landing, they had this fully HD movie of the whole landing sequence, it was amazing, okay. They're at Mars, which is a lot closer, and they have big relay antennas, satellites in orbit, okay. Our antenna is just directly sending data home to Earth, so we will get pictures, but it's gonna take weeks and weeks before we have really good pictures that we're able to send home. But we will be able to send uh, all those pictures back um, and take pictures uh, as we go, and as we land at many different sites. So our nominal mission is three years and four months, and so we're gonna be flying for quite a long time. We fly actually about once per month. So we'll fly for uh, about half an hour every month, and arrive at a new site, and then we're on the ground the rest of the time. So basically, we're gonna be doing these landings once a month, and we're gonna have new pictures from a brand new site. We'll be able to take samples from a brand new site and tell you what they're made of. Um, so in the end, uh, in conclusion, uh, we're using rotors and a helicopter, a quadcopter, to move around on Titan the same way we've used rovers to move around on Mars with wheels. And what we hope to do there once we get to Titan, is to measure the composition of this now solid ice, but previously liquid water. Uh, and we want to do that to measure its chemistry and figure out how far the chemistry on this frozen ice moon has progressed toward the formation of life. We want to measure the various different environments on Titan to identify what environments may have been habitable in the past or may be habitable today. And we actually do have the ambition to be able to detect the chemical signatures of life or self-replicating molecules, if those exist today or if they did exist in the past and have subsequently frozen. So I think this is a really uh, exciting mission. It's been funded by NASA. We are going forward. Uh, I was just at a meeting two weeks ago where we passed our preliminary design review. Uh, which is our big gate review uh, before NASA uh, you know, makes the agreement to, to continue funding us the rest of the way. Um, and I found out that there are over 1,000 people working on this mission. Engineers, scientists, um, you know, schedule people, people, uh, people, people working on budgets, all kinds of people all around the country um, actively working on this mission uh, and so it's like, it's a little intimidating. <laughs> okay, this is an idea that myself and my colleagues, um, you know, drew on the back of a napkin in, in February of 2016. And now we're, a, you know, a fully funded federal project. Um, and there are all these people working on it. So it better work. Um, I hope it does. So we hope to, uh, that you'll join me again in 2034 when I'll show you all the awesome new pictures uh, when we get there. So hope to see you there.